You're listening to the Archaic Drum Podcast. In-depth conversations with great visionaries and free thinkers of today. Beat by beat, evolving self and society through ancient wisdom and emerging paradigms. With your host, James Benton. Welcome. This is their 18th episode recorded on August 11th, 2014. Today we have with us Dr. Richard Grossman. Richard is an acupuncturist and an oriental medical doctor who works extensively with a variety of healing modalities which include herbal medicine, sound healing, and ayahuasca. Richard began his search for meaning at an early age when he developed a strong interest in the nature of healing. Early on in his education, he had the assignment to decide what he wanted to be when he grew up. Without thinking, his answer was that he wanted to study the effects of plants and medicines on the mind. This without even knowing that such a thing existed. His spiritual search also started early. He was a voracious reader focusing on Asian and South Asian philosophies and shamanism. By the age of 15, he had concluded that the only reason to be alive was to help others out of their suffering, and it was the beginning of his calling to the path of the healer. Richard's spiritual journey took him next to India. There, on the banks of the Ganges, he studied meditation and the deep connection between body, mind, and spirit. Shortly after beginning his medical practice, his lifelong interest in healing and spirit merged again, joined this time by the power and profound beauty of entheogens with sound and music, and went on to study extensively with indigenous healers in Ecuador and Peru. Since then, he has become recognized for the healing work he does in ceremonial settings. His work is a unique combination of traditional Amazonian shamanism, deep energetic healing, and sound healing techniques from many of the world's cultures. He now leads ayahuasca ceremonies in many parts of the world and continues to offer his gifts and wisdom in the service of helping others. Richard, welcome. How's it going there today? I'm excellent, thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us here. I remember telling you a while back that um, I thought you had given the best explanation of what ayahuasca is, essentially. To those who are not so familiar with what we're speaking about here, could you give us a bit of information on what ayahuasca is and why do you think it's so important as something that could be helpful to us at this time? Sure. Um, you know, to really get what it is, you have to go back in time quite a ways into the Amazon jungle, to the Amazon rainforest, to the upper, we think the upper Rio Napo area where ayahuasca, the the vine initially started growing. And, you know, we're going back somewhere between thousands to tens of thousands of years. Nobody really knows. And the people that lived in the jungle, the jungle was their source of food, their source of clothing, their source of tools and their source of medicines. And they were extraordinary pharmacologists of the jungle. They knew so much about each plant in the jungle out of the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different species, which ones were safe, which ones were poisonous, which ones were medicinal and so they were explorers and experimenters. They didn't have anything else. Mm-hmm. Ayahuasca is a vine that grows up um, on trees, reaching for the light. Most people think that initially the 
jungle healers use just this vine in strong teas. And it takes, it takes really several days to cook the vine into a usable medicine. The vine itself has a strong purgative effect on the body, a cleansing effect, and it also has a strong anti-worm effect or anti-parasite effect. Really, I didn't know um, that. Living in the tropics, of course, parasites are continuously a problem, especially in those times before there was refrigeration. Um, the tropics, to me, is like uh, the Amazon is like this immense experiment of Mother Nature, where there are, for example, there's more species of trees in 10 acres or 10 hectares than there are in most of North America. Wow. So the vine was used as a medicine, and it also has a strong, or the vine itself has a mild to moderate psychoactive effect where it gives you access to the spirit world. Mm -hmm. In the jungle cosmos, all of the plants are spirits. Each plant has its own spirit. Each plant has its own consciousness, its own intention. Yeah. So the vine would give the early pharmacologists or the early botanists a way to tune into the plant world. Uh -huh. At some point, they started, probably early on, started adding different plants to the mixture. Because as, as explorers and as people who were aware that plants worked in synergy, they would explore what different options were. And given the sensitivity to the plants that the vine gives you what they say is at some point the vine told them to add another plant to it chakruna uh -huh. or chakraponga is a different plant that can be added to it and what that does is it turns on the light of the visions and so the combination of chakruna and ayahuasca or chakraponga and ayahuasca creates the brew that today we call ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. uh, many other plants can be added depending on specific effects, although most people in my experience use primarily the chakruna and the ayahuasca. What it does is magic. There's no really other way to explain it. I mean, you can explain it with psychopharmacology, with you know, now inhibitor and DMT and all of that stuff. But what it does is it opens up the person who is taking it to a realm of healing within them that I don't think is accessible in too many other ways. Yeah. Many people have said, well, you can get there through meditation and yoga, and you can't. With meditation and yoga, you can get to where meditation and yoga take you, which is a very profound and place, but ayahuasca has its own way of working. So when a person takes ayahuasca under proper guidance, under proper ceremonial situations, and I think that's critically important to understand, is that without the ceremony, you're not really getting the medicine. The ceremony is an integral part, it took thousands of years to develop the form and the songs or the ikaros, the healing songs that are part of ceremony. Mm -hmm. Why it's valuable for us today is that, how to say it, we're messed up. We're a messed up species, we're a messed up race. Well, it seems um, like something went wrong. We've taken this beautiful planet and we're basically seem to be working really hard to destroy anything in it that's beautiful, anything in it that's clean, anything in it that's pristine and pure, yeah. whether consciously or unconsciously this is occurring mm -hmm. through greed, through avarice, through just, you know, the gut-wrenching need to survive under difficult circumstances. Yeah, yeah. 
we don't know. I don't know. It's it's a combination of many different things. Yeah. Uh, we're also, you know, for example, one day you wear glasses. You might have done this once. I was furiously looking for my glasses in this rather large building I was in. Mm-hmm. And furiously looking for them every place, and I couldn't find them any place. And one of my friends saw me and said, "Well, what are you looking for?" And I said, "My glasses." And she started like snickering, looked at me, and said, <clears throat> "Excuse me, but you're wearing them." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so we see the world through the filters that are so close to us that we don't know we're wearing them anymore. We see the world through multiple generations of ways of being, of ways of perception that are so ingrained in us that there's not a lot of awareness in most people that there's a different way of being. Yeah. So ayahuasca takes those sunglasses off of our eyes and opens us up in a profoundly powerful and profoundly sometimes terrifying and sometimes ecstatically beautiful journey within. Well, that was certainly my experience with it. Could you speak a little bit about your own process with this medicine? Richard, what effect has it had on your life, do you think? Oh, it's profoundly changed and improved my life in ways that to me are unimaginable. Um, I I first experienced ayahuasca probably close to 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the experience that I had at that point was a profound realization that forgiveness was the route to healing was the route to healing Mm -hmm. and um at the at the moment you know i was experiencing this a part of me was fairly horrified by what i was experiencing it was essentially a tour of through history of inhumanity pretty much starting off with me being a witness to a Nazi concentration camp and going back to the Colosseum in Rome and going way, 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 way back in time to so many different Vietnam War, World War I, so many situations where human beings were excruciating cruel to each other and where men were excruciatingly cruel to women. Mm-hmm. And In each one of these vistas I was shown, I was pretty much stuck there until like the first time I was witnessing this concentration camp and 3D, everything except smell. And, you know, what do I do here with my question? And I just like put it out, you know, what do I do with this? Yeah. And the answer came verbally to me, which is unusual for my experience, but the answer came in as trust and forgive. Trust the experience that you're having and forgive completely what you're seeing. And of course, the next question was, well, how can I forgive this? This was horrific. Yeah. And the answer came to me is like, you forgive it by letting go of all attachment in your being to the connection, the egoistic or ego ego connection, the memory of this experience and just let time wash it away. And each one of these scenes that I was put in, I had to go through this and <laughs> Hard to believe, but from, you know, Nazi Germany, they got increasingly horrific. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was quite an experience. Yeah, and when I, when I was done, when the experience was starting to taper off, I felt so much spaciousness inside of me 
that hadn't been there before that made me realize or recognize that even though this wasn't, these weren't topics I was obsessing about in my life at all. I didn't even think about them. Mm-hmm. You know, unless I was watching Schindler's List or something, you know, I didn't even think about them, but they were in my karmic field, for lack of a better term. They were in my field, yeah. in my subconscious, in my unconscious mind. And so ayahuasca brings these things up for the purpose of allowing the person who is in the healing process to release them and to be healed. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen this work with war vets, you know, people who were, who did, you know, actually did horrific things, actually did things that were inhuman to other human beings. Yeah. And watch them go from extremely in the process of post-traumatic stress disorder to in a number of ceremonies, not very many, being free of that wound. Beautiful. It doesn't make what they did right. It doesn't make any of history right. No. But it allows you to live in a state of freedom. Mm Mm-hmm. Which, to my mind, you know, if we look at the whole idea of karma and, you know, to me, karma, karma is what you don't forgive, you're, you have to repeat, you know, until you get it, until you understand that that is not right action, that is not right way to be. And so in some ways, I, I believe that ayahuasca, when used properly, is a karmic eraser or is a karmic healer. It has, it has all sorts of physical effects, too, that are amazing, but that's another topic. Yeah. In relation to what you were speaking about, I understand that you've guided individuals in ceremony. You've been diagnosed with PTSD. Um, what did you observe after working with those people, and what do you know, if anything, about how they're getting along with their lives right now. The ones that I've worked with that I'm still connected to are doing phenomenally better in their lives. Mm -hmm. I've observed in ceremony is there's always that moment of a recognition that the past is the past. Yeah. And that the past can be released. Mm-hmm. There's there's some really interesting research being done on on the way ayahuasca and some other entheogens affect the brain in those who are caring for PTSD. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not a neurochemist or a researcher, so I would be remiss to try to uh, talk about those right now. But it's fascinating work. And in my mind, what it really is doing, though, is giving the brain an opportunity to reset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's giving the brain an opportunity. Because if you look at at PTSD as being a neural pathway, you could almost look at it as being, you know, if you walk on trails... You can see in some places the trails go into the ground because so many feet have walked on those trails Mm -hmm. and it gets very difficult to not walk on those trails. And, you know, post-traumatic stress and whether it's from war or from (laughs) watching a seriously bad movie when you were a kid creates pathways in the brain that become brain that become almost impossible to break out of. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in my experience with working with these people, working with many people with stress disorders or traumatic stress disorders, um, the ayahuasca along with their own work, because there's always work involved in it, 
and along with the work of the ceremony, kind of smooths off those pathways mm-hmm. and, you know, creates or opens up many, many different ways of being that are possible. Mm-hmm. Gives one a, a quite a larger view of the situation at hand, huh? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, on, 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 a, on a bigger sort of mm-hmm. viewpoint, and this is an idea I have or a, a, something I like to play with, is that, you know, the origins, <coughs> the origins of war go back you know, 15, 20, who knows how many tens of thousands of years. Yeah, millennial. And it's like a mistake was made at some point. And that mistake started this path of history. And so what we're experiencing today in Iraq, what we're experiencing today in you know, I don't know how many places there's wars going on in the world right now, but there's a lot of them, are the effect of tens of thousands of years of habitual post-traumatic stress disorder in the, our species. And, you know, many people look at ayahuasca as being an ambassador from the plant kingdom an ambassador from Mother Nature, from Pachamama, to, you know, take people from this horrible, wounded, fear-based, terror-based way of looking at reality and resetting that to living life in harmony, living life in a state of being that is not conflict-based. Yeah. We've spoke some here about the positive aspects of this medicine and its ability to help one heal from a variety of emotional problems and physical illnesses. Um, And we spoke a little bit about the rough edges as well. And there exist within my own experience and others I've spoken to as well the possibility of some very bizarre and at times frightening experiences that arrive for one who who takes this medicine. Um, during my own ceremonies, I found myself more than once wondering why certain experiences were happening to me. Um, experiences would come that seemingly seemingly had no relation at all to any known issues in my life. Do you think that there's just a bit of extra sensory mud that we have to wade through during uh, a ceremony, or is there some reason for each particular experience that arrives uh, that we just need to look at it a bit closer to discover that meaning? Good question. Uh, let me introduce here the profound idea of brain farts. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm familiar with that idea. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> so I welcome those. <laughs> you know, the, the kind of map I like is I saw a Tibetan Tonka. Well, I've seen many Tibetan Tonkas, but the one that I saw that just really seems like a map of the inner experiences. You have a Buddha sitting in the center in a state of utter calmness, you know, utter serenity. And then there's multiple circles around him that depict various aspects of, you know, not only our reality, but all of the inner realities, Mm -hmm. you know, the devils and monsters, the realm of the angels and gods and goddesses, the realm of the human realm, the realm of aging and death, the realm of, you know, the whatever else there is there. I mean, many, many realms. 
and yet in the center is total serenity. And to me, a lot of the lower astral stuff that happens in, you know, in dream state and meditation in ayahuasca, the mud, if you will, is just stuff that needs to be passed through. Mm -hmm. You know, passed through on this journey into the heart. And it's, you know, it's the realm of the unconsciousness. And in the Andean philosophy, you have this idea of the three worlds, the lower world, the middle world, and the upper world, right. with the lower world being the world of the, uh, they call it the world of the dead, you know, the world of the spirits, the world of the monsters, the world of, in our parlance, the unconscious mind, you know, the place on the old maps where you're you know here's this here's that and then there's the little thing there be dragons and you know for we don't know what the heck there is there so there's monsters there and you know that's part of us that's part of what's going on in our unconscious mind most people are afraid of it and you know there's really no need to be afraid of it it's just yeah. stuff yeah. and Passing through it can be, you know, like it's it's the cliche of why am I doing this? You know, what am I doing this for? Because it's very unpleasant. Um, in ceremony, in a good ceremony, in my experience, at some point, then, you know, there's a purge, whether it's diarrhea or vomiting, you know, and this unconscious junk, which is not only emotional toxicity, it's karmic toxicity, it's also physical toxicity. Yeah. You know, because we have absorbed toxins from the moment we're born. Yeah. We live in the most toxic time ever. In, On multiple levels. Um, freight trains. I saw, uh, this was like probably close to 15 years ago, uh, graphic of toxins produced just in the United States would fill a tra freight train from Los Angeles to Chicago every year. Wow. Every year. And, okay. you know, that was a long time ago. Probably it's Chicago and back by now. Um, so when the purge comes and these physical toxins come out, there's a relationship between physical toxicity and emotional toxicity. And so when this stuff comes out, also the lower unconscious garbage that we've accumulated can also come out. Sometimes it doesn't even need a purge. You can just put light into it. You can just heal it by consciousness, by awareness. And does it need to be dissected? You know, I saw a, you know, what is it, the bug-eyed beast, and you know, do I need to figure out what it meant? I personally don't think so. I think it is just garbage there that needs to come out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it kind of brings up another interesting aspect of ayahuasca work that I've heard a lot of people say, and when I hear it, I kind of shudder inside, and it's um, the medicine told me to dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of the famous thing in, in Peru is people go down there, they've drunk ayahuasca once or twice in the jungle, and they'll say, well, the medicine told me to build a center here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll invest their life savings into it, borrow money from family and friends, buy some land, build some structures, and suddenly realize they have no idea what they're doing there or how to survive there. Mm -hmm. You know, so the mind is tricky. And, you know, in that going back to that tanka, the place of reality is that place of serenity. Yeah. It's not the place of receiving messages from, you know, dead people or extraterrestrials or entities or whatever because right. do we really know if they're friendly 
do we really know if they have our best interest at heart? Or do we really know if that aspect of the mind is just a reflection of something that has yet to be healed? Right, exactly. Yeah, it seems as though uh, one should not only shine much awareness on what they experience within one of these ceremonies, but to question it quite deeply um, as to what it's telling us. Yeah. You know, my, my model of ceremony work is, and it's almost something that I could time with a clock, <laughs> although I don't look at clocks during ceremony, but I almost could. Like the first portion of it is getting through this mud, getting through the, the fears and the toxicities and the places that are unpleasant inside, you know, the places that haven't been looked at, the tra- traumas, the regrets, the remorses, the losses, the relationship breakups, the things that we've done that we don't feel good about in our lives. And, you know, through the songs, through the music, driving the ceremony through that, not 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 in the way of denial, but in a way of like, here we are, let's get through this. Mm-hmm. And then at some point there's a breakthrough and it becomes joyous. Yeah. It becomes beautiful. It becomes static at times. And to me, that's a lot of people think that healing to be healing has to be painful. It has to be arduous. It has to be negative. It seems some do. In my viewpoint, that entering into that ecstatic state, that entering into joy, into love, into beauty, is vastly more healing than trudging through the mud. Yeah. You know, there, there's a there's a great story that one of my teachers used to say is like light and darkness. Darkness was pissed off because everybody liked light, and nobody liked darkness. So darkness kept on calling up light and saying, "We have to have a fight. We have to fight it out. See who's the most powerful here." And you know, after many t- attempts, light just decided to give in and say, "Okay, we'll have a fight." And we'll do it here in darkness, of course, being dark and being sneaky and, you know, underhanded, went to the site of the fight first and set up all these horrific dark traps, you know, these things that would just ensnare light into darkness. Mm-hmm. The day came of the fight, and light went into this fighting ring, looked around, and saw no darkness. Mm-hmm. Because where there's light, You know, there cannot be darkness. Where there's light, there cannot be anything other than light. Seems that way. So bringing the light in, bringing the consciousness in, what the Vedic um, saints and scholars called Satchitananda, bringing truth, bringing consciousness, bringing joy into one's being is vastly more healing than dissecting the mud. Yeah, I think so. You spoke briefly there, you touched on sound and music within this process, and I understand you've worked much with those in relation to health and healing. The Icaros songs are an integral part of an ayahuasca ceremony, but how do you think that sound in general, could you give us a deeper uh, insight on how it plays a part in general in the healing process, Richard. Yeah, well, it was Aldous Huxley who said, next to silence, the closest experience of God is music. I think I came I may be misquoting that. that slightly, but uh, it's close to that anyway. Um, you know, my, my path to healing has, for many years, incorporated sound. And, you know, music, there's so many cliches about music. It's the universal language. You know, it tames the savage beast. Yeah. Many, many things like that. Yeah. You know, so, so the Icaros 
our songs revealed by the medicine that affect healing on a person. Mm -hmm. There's many Icaros, and for those who go deep into the process, each medicinal plant, each teacher plant, um, has its own song. It's going into deep Amazonian traditional healing work now. And you find the song of the plant by doing a process called dieta, which is essentially removing all external stimulation, including spicy foods, including sex, including talking to other people, including everything other than sitting in a little hut in the jungle in quiet not even allowed to listen to music, not even allowed to read a book. It's just sitting with yourself for days, weeks, months, sometimes people do it for up to two or three years. Yeah. And you're taking the medicine every night along with one of the teacher plants. And eventually the teacher plant starts revealing to you a song. Mm -hmm. And it's the song of the plant. It can be this powerful and well, this dramatic, I, I was once in the jungle. I went from the jungle to the mountains, back to the jungle. And you've been to Peru and you know how polluted it can get with diesel fumes and yeah. you know, dust and a lot of stuff going on there. And so I went up to the mountains with a bit of a cold. In the mountains, the cold turned into bronchitis. I came back to the jungle went about three hours into the jungle from the Quitos to do, to do a dieta ceremony. I forget how long, but I was there for several weeks eventually. And several days into it, my bronchitis got really bad and I was in ceremony at night and it was turning into an asthmatic condition. As somebody who studied medicine, you know, my, my doctor mind was like, well, this is really bad. You're three hours from a hospital. You're starting to go into an inability to breathe. There's no way you'll get to the hospital in time for treatment. You're going to probably die tonight. <laughs> you know, stuff mm -hmm. that the mind does. But I'm coughing up gobs of mucus. I'm starting to gasp for air. And the court and air calls me up and sings a song, actually sang two songs. And I'm sitting there, you know, gasping for breath and then listening to the song, and listening and listening and getting absorbed in the song and kind of melting into the song. And I go back to where I was sitting, take a few deep breaths. And I'm just like, oh, that was such a beautiful song. Wow. And about a minute or two later, it's like, wait a second, I'm not rattling. I'm not wheezing. I'm not gasping. There's no more mucus. In How? What? Uh, uh, uh. How did that happen? And uh, so the next day I said, what did you do? You know, how did you do that? And he said, you know, I just sing a couple songs to your lungs. Incredible. Incredible. So, you know, Icaros are like songs that heal. They can heal emotional wounds. They can heal so many different things in a person. Um, yeah, I experienced them as something quite powerful. With music, like I, I incorporate a lot of music into the work I do, uh, live music, didgeridoos, mm -hmm. flutes, kalimbas, Tibetan bowls, gongs, uh, many things that are from different cultures that have been jaw harps, that have been used by curanderos, by shamans, by healers, uh, by meditators in the past. and. Each one of them has its own specific magic that has an effect on people that changes their, first off, your, the sound enters your ears, of course, but the sound also enters your body. And, but the sound enters your the ears, goes to your brain. And we know that the greatest drug factory, even greater, or medicine factory, even greater than the Amazon rainforest is our brain. Yeah. It's a neurochemical, neuropeptide factory that makes things in the realm of billions of times a second. Yeah. 
you know, so as these sounds enter our brain, the brain responds to those by creating neuropeptides. Mm-hmm. This is my theory. Mm-hmm. Creating neuropeptides that then, you know, relatively instantly travel to the body and start affecting physiological changes, mm-hmm. emotional changes. Um, there's also the part of music that it gets increasingly difficult to think negative thoughts, the better the music is. Yeah. Well, Richard, uh, my experience from uh, listening to Icaros um, within a ceremonial setting was something quite astounding right from the beginning. I can remember at my first ceremony, um, everyone had tossed back to the brew waiting for what was to arrive and after the first note was sung at last um, after 30 or 40 minutes let me tell you the puke started hitting the bucket um, and I was just uh left in amazement uh, at what a song can do to affect not only emotional but um, physiological changes in the body I, I was just I was just floored anyway Richard thanks for giving us a bit more insight on what that's all about sure. Yeah, we're, with 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 the medicine and with the ikaros, we we are entering a realm of true magic. Yeah, magic. You know, it makes Harry Potter look like child's play. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> and ideally, the magic is used for healing. Mm-hmm. It's used for enlightening. Yeah, Richard, uh, I'm aware that tobacco is a very important plant mm-hmm. for an ayahuasquero shaman in South America. Could you tell us a bit about tobacco's role in the healing process and why it's such an important plant to a shaman? Sure. Tobacco Tobacco is a very interesting plant that, you know, the current Western mindset of tobacco is, of course, tobacco, cancer, heart disease, yeah. cancer, heart disease, cancer, heart disease. And, you know, in a, in a big way, that's because we tend to abuse it and have divorced it from its sacredness and turned it into a severe addictive process. There's a lot of chemicals added to commercial tobacco as well. I have a document on my computer scroll through for almost, you know, 15 seconds at top speed, and it's all the chemicals that can be put in an average cigarette. And that's not even including the chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, et cetera, that are used in the growing process of most tobacco. Um... In the Amazonian tradition, tobacco is considered to be the mother of ayahuasca. So that's the esteem that it's held in, is of a very powerful curandero, very powerful healer and teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, Ceremonially, tobacco has the ability to hold prayer, to contain a person's prayer. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if this is the South American or North American tradition, but tobacco is considered to be food for the spirit world, food for the good spirits Mm -hmm. or the good healers that are in that realm close to us, but not quite touching us very often. So when I do a ceremony, I'll, I have a pipe that's full of mapacho, which is a wild variety of tobacco from the Amazon, Nicotiana rustica. Yeah, rustica. 
mystica, in Spanish, mystica. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a very powerful form of tobacco. The main commercial use of which is for insecticides. That's how strong it is. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I'll I'll be you know you can see uh, the curanderos in the Amazon doing this. They'll you know be whistling or blowing into their pipe or you know praying into it. And then, you know, lighting it, blowing it on their body, blowing it onto the medicine, blowing it onto their mesa or altar if they have one, mm -hmm. and blowing the prayer into the room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it is food for good spirit, it drives bad spirits away. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like in, in the Japanese tradition um of um the flower arranging they say bad spirits don't like pretty flowers mm -hmm. you know? so in the same way bad spirits don't like tobacco uh -huh. so if i'm working or the sh the curandero is working on somebody you know doing a, a a healing on them they'll often blow tobacco on them into their mm -hmm. hand to their crown into their heart and that has the effect of driving away these negative energies mm -hmm. and also the effect of putting the prayer into the person. Mm -hmm. um, people can use tobacco as a diet plan, drinking a tobacco juice. I don't recommend doing this on your own or with anybody who's not extremely qualified because the difference between Fatal and medicinal is very narrow, and you know, drinking tobacco juice can easily kill you. Mm -hmm. So you know that that's the basic use of it is to implant prayer and blessings in somebody, and to cleanse or do a limpia in Spanish. It's called mm -hmm. a cleanse on a person using the smoke of the tobacco, much in the same way that you know in North America or in a lot of the uh, more or less spiritual to be world people will you know take sage and blow sage mm -hmm. up in the jungle societies they use tobacco mm -hmm. there's also one there one more mm -hmm. thing there is uh, uh, the term in Spanish is uh, soplar which means to blow mm -hmm. and much of Amazonian shamanism uses this blowing action to usually with a sound effect added to it you know, like whoosh, 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 things like that mm -hmm. um to have an effect on the environment mm -hmm. sometimes you know getting into the otter area of ayahuasca work and this kind of work is sometimes you know a negative energy will enter the space either from the outside or from something that's coming out of somebody mm -hmm. you know sometimes ceremonies it's like it makes you know the exorcist look like kindergarten you know the movie <laughs> yeah well i hear you brother <laughs> sometimes real nasty <laughs> stuff is coming out of people and you know the uh, person leading the ceremony will you know do something like that to just basically blow it to smithereens, or blow it out of the room. Power the breath. So with tobacco, that so clar, that blowing becomes very powerful. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Richard, I remember before I'd made the decision that I would take this medicine, I had viewed several videos of ceremonies taking place on our beloved YouTube. And I must say, it didn't provide me with much encouragement uh, in light of what I saw some of the people going through. What would you, we have a few people out there, I think, that are probably sitting firmly on the fence that uh, feels like uh, in some way uh, they may have some calling to take this medicine. What would you uh, say 
to someone or do you have anything to say who is considering working with ayahuasca don't Don't watch youtube um yeah please don't do that unless it's you or me of course i think Uh, i screwed up a little bit with that there's really two schools of thought around this work i mean there's many more than two but I'm going to differentiate it into two for this purpose. There's the psychonaut school, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, take whatever you can, see what it does to you. Um, You know, if it's great, great. If it's horrible, great. If it's this great, if it's that great, because we're inner explorers. Yeah. And then there's the tradition, which is curanderismo, which is healing. Curanderismo comes from the Spanish root curar, to heal. So there's there's the healing aspect of it. I would strongly recommend for anybody who wants to do this to seek out good, reputable healers. Yeah. You know, and not to go, you know, I mean, I, I've heard stories, there's people in the States now who you know, basically do ayahuasca rave style stuff or ayahuasca cuddle puddles or ayahuasca, <laughs> you know, sex parties. Um, oh, I haven't explored this I don't know yet. if this is true. I've never seen it myself. <laughs> I don't ever want to see it myself. But, you know, I've, I've heard this. And, uh, you know, watch out for that stuff. Go for somebody who is using it if not in a fully traditional manner with great respect for the tradition that it comes from. Absolutely. Um, Know also that healing to be dramatic, dramatic healing doesn't have to be dramatic. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you're, you know, if, if you hear stories of, yeah, I mean, the whole room was screaming their heads off all night. It was amazing. You know, Watch yeah. out, because to me that means that the ceremony is not being contained properly. Right. You know, in, in ceremonies that I lead, for example, people don't talk, people don't scream, some people cry because it's coming out of them. But they're very meditative, they're very spiritual, they're very deep, beautiful, loving ceremonies. So seek out somebody who is working on that level. Not of, you know, boy, you know, I can, people were scary out of their minds. That's just trauma. That's just re-traumatizing. You know, there's the whole work of of Peter Levine, who I deeply respect the way that he views trauma. And one of his guiding posts is to heal trauma, you don't re-traumatize the person. Mm -hmm. Don't take them into their trauma because that just makes it worse. And so when I when I hear, you know, like, oh, there was some movie, I'm not going to say what it was, but half the movie was, you know, help me, help me, help me, you know. That's yeah. not the way that it needs to happen. No. You know, because the help is here. The help is in the heart. All you need to do is be in a ceremonial situation with ayahuasca or any other medicine that takes you deep into your heart, that does not leave you, you know, wallowing, trapped, stuck in that realm of the mud. Yeah. I don't think that's beneficial. I don't, I don't, I don't personally, I can't find any rationale for having that in any way, shape or form beneficial to people. Yeah, me either. So choose who you are going to work with carefully. I've I've seen people who huh, literally come to one or two ceremonies and go online and order ayahuasca, and the next thing you know, they're a shaman leading ceremonies, and they don't last long, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But what kind of damage can be done to a person's psyche, to a person's being that is trapped in that realm of the unconscious mind and can't get out of it yeah. or is not able to be, it's not in a container that encourages leaving that and going into the light. Yeah. Yeah. So be careful. It's, it's, you know, 
really in, in all things, let the buyer beware, but especially in this work, let the buyer beware. Um, there's a lot of people go down to the jungle and, you know, the first taxi driver they get takes them to an ayahuasca ceremony. Because really obvious when somebody's going there to do ayahuasca you know it's yeah it's, it's hard to hide you know, tax go, aha money you know and they take them to some house and somebody gives them some brew that you know is not the best thing in the world and you know you get in trouble so yeah, yeah. reputable places where people are working with integrity people are working for light for love for healing is really important not for drama. It's really easy for a ceremony leader to create a situation that's extremely dramatic. Like my, one of my fourth or fifth ceremonies I did in the jungle. I'm sitting there, you know, and the jungle spirits are coming and welcoming me and there's so much beauty and, you know, there's so much light and I'm just loving every second of it. And then the person leading the ceremony says, oh my God, there's an evil shaman outside coming to get us, an evil brujo, they call them, coming to get us. And, you know, I'm just sitting there in, in really a beautiful state, and I look outside, and think, oh, I don't see anybody out there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he's like ranting and raving about how he has to protect us, and he's going to save us, and it's, you know, there's poison darts coming at us, and I'm like, you know, WTF, dude, you know. <laughs> what, what's going on here, you know? And uh, after a while, I was I was like, well, the only evil person in this room is this guy trying to scare the people sitting in the yeah. And people were like, oh, no, you know, help me, help me, you know. And I, 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 I happen to be a bit of a jerk sometimes in these situations. And I happen to have a didgeridoo with me. So after a little bit of this, I just pulled out the didgeridoo and started wailing on it. And, you know, next to, next to an Icaro, <laughs> I think a didgeridoo has a lot more power. <laughs> yeah. so it goes way back in time. And so I'm playing the didgeridoo and Powerful I played probably indeed. 10 minutes and then stopped. And, you know, the room was like, he was up there with his jaw dropped and, you know, what just happened to me? And then he started singing so beautifully. And all of this, you know, evil nonsense was gone. And, you know, I, I feel like I accomplished something that day. I don't know if it lasted, but I feel like something was accomplished. And, you know, so that that level of, and it's it's a big dramatic thing in the Amazon. You know, it's one of the reasons I don't really go to the Amazon anymore is there's this inter- shamanic war going on there all the time of like mm -hmm. I'm the most powerful, no I'm the most powerful no I'm the most powerful, no let's throw darts at each other until one of us gets killed and see what happens you know mm -hmm. and and so you do have a lot of using ayahuasca for dark purposes mm -hmm. going on there and it's subtle, it can be really subtle mm -hmm. um but you do have that going on there. And to me, it's just boring. It's it's like, I don't want to be involved in that. Right. I, I refuse personally to be involved in it. So, you know, going for the truth, you know, going for that Satchitananda, going for that truth, consciousness, and joy, um, or bliss, is the direction that... If the person leading the ceremony is doing that, if that's their intention, if that's their goal, then you're going into a good ceremony. Yeah, it can be a beautiful thing. Richard, thanks so much for speaking with me. Um, I'll post a link to your website on my webpage. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with before we sign off here? Two things. One is that I firmly believe that these plant medicines, um, along with other practices, meditation, you know, real yoga, um, sitting, are 
humanity's, perhaps humanity's last best hope for survival at this time because we need to shift, we need to change. And it's no joke, we're cutting off the branch we're sitting on, you know, we're, we're, we're destroying the planet we live on, we need to learn how to live in harmony. Yeah, that's true. And with that in mind, it is yeah. utterly and totally absurd that these sacred medicines are not legal. It certainly is, isn't it? Richard Grossman, thanks again for speaking with me here today. Perhaps we can meet along the road at some point and speak about these things some more. So it's a good topic. Thank you. All the best. Have a good day there. You too. We are able to continue these conversations through your generous contributions. If you've enjoyed this dialogue or any of our other episodes, please consider making a donation on our podcast page at www.archaicdrum.com. Also, make sure to sign our mailing list for updates on future episodes and other content on our website. And thanks so much again for listening. Listening.